Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have artist and writer Kiana Mestrich as tonight's guest speaker. Kiana is best known for her conceptual photographs, books, and installations that employ archival and found photography, text, and ephemera to reference themes of race, gender, motherhood, and consumerism. She is the founder of Dodge and Burn, uh, decolonizing Photography History, established in 2007, an arts initiative that aims to diversify the medium's history by advocating for photographers of color. Dodge and Burn began as a blog and now functions as a monthly critique group in New York City. Her writing on photography has been published in art journals like Lightworks, Contact Sheet, and Focus Nueva Luz. ARC Magazine and Exposure, she is the co-editor of How We Do Both, Art and Motherhood, a diverse collection of honest responses from contemporary artists on raising children and making art. Kiana is a faculty member at the Fashion Institute of Technology and ICP Bard College. Please help me welcome Kiana Mestrich to our lecture series. Uh, making images for me is very much a personal endeavor um, and life-sustaining endeavor. Um, I rarely use photography in any sort of commercial sense. Um, I, I use the camera, the camera and the images I produce as research tools. Um, tonight I'm going to be showing you um, just three to four series or bodies of work, um, most of which is sort of the conceptual work, and towards the end I'll show you a bit of sort of the family documentary style um, work that I do as well. Um, the images that I make enable me to under examine the circumstances I was born under and in the country that I was raised in, the United States, where no matter who your people are and where you're from, being non-white implies being colored, and being colored historically means being black. So how does someone like me of mixed heritage make sense of this sort of limited American identity? I'd like to share this quote with you. How many people know Stuart Hall? That's typically the response I get in an American setting. Um, so Stuart Hall was a British cultural theorist. Um, he was from the Caribbean originally, but went to England um, very young, as a young child. Um, and he was really pivotal in shaping um, the academic study of cultural studies. Um, he's also wrote a lot about photography. Um, and he's a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, and he wrote a lot about identity as well. And um, I really love this quote. Um, about from him, it says, identity is formed and transformed continuously in relation to the ways in which we are represented or addressed in the cultural, and I kind of uh, changed this quote a bit by inserting and capitalist systems which surround us. I highly recommend looking up uh, Stuart Hall's writings if you haven't before. Um, the question of identity often begins with our families um, and our social relations, relational cultures. This picture on the left is of me and my mom. This is our first trip to Panama, where she's from. And I really cherish and love this photo. Um, this photo on the left is of my, um, my father. He's in a group setting. That's him in the very top, sorry, the very top right. Um, this is the only photo I have of my father. And this photo I came to um, come into my possession in my early 20s, it was, this was sent to me via email correspondence. Um, this is the only photograph I said I have of my father. Uh, my parents met in New York because where else would a Panamanian and a Croatian meet but here in New York? Um, photography never played a major role in my known family. There was no official photographer, no abundant archive of albums. Um, with my, within my mother's family, our photographs were usually stashed. I found them, would find them in plastic bags in my grandmother's dresser, um, safeguarded in her bureaus. Um, and in, my just, in her justified anger against my father, um, who was absent for most of our life, um, my mother um, never had any pictures of him. Um, this lack of pictorial heritage and photographic representation of our existence is what I believe initially drew me to the medium as a teenager. Photography became a language I could use to describe my identity. As you hear and see tonight, my artistic processes are research-driven and aim to uncover personal heritage and history. This self-authorship is essential to living when much of your past is unknown. So what you see here are two images for an advertisement for Kiana fabric. This is what I was named after. 
um, our given names can also be reference points for identities. I was named after Kiana Nylon, which is a, uh, released in 1964 by DuPont. Uh, and these are advertisements for what was a, then a synthetic silk-like fabric. The DuPont family arrived in America from Paris on January 1st, 1800. Anybody know the DuPont family or have heard of the DuPont family? They're um, a third largest chemical company in the world at this point. Um, and they're known for other things um, like chemicals. But very early on, their first um, product was gunpowder. And um, before, so before they made chemicals and synthetics, they manufactured gunpowder between 1802 and 1880. During the American Civil War, DuPont supplied half the gunpowder used by the Union Army. War was good business for DuPont, and they subsequently built the first world-scale munition plant in the U.S. Worldwide, DuPont became known as, quote, the merchants of death, a family that profited from violence. Due to political tensions in Japan in the 1930s, the United States could no longer procure silk, a strong natural fiber coveted for its domestic, industrial, and commercial purposes. In search for an alternative silk, DuPont invented nylon in 1935. It was first used to make toothbrushes and manufactured in the 1940s as women's silk or stockings. Because of an embargo <laughs> against Japanese silk during World War II, nylon stockings were recycled and used for parachutes, mosquito netting, surgical sutures, you know, band-aids, so on and so forth. So again, DuPont was profiting from war. Introduced in 1968, and here are two more other images for this Kiana nylon. Um, it was a cheaper alternative to silk, yet just as luxurious and required no ironings, really sort of a radical thing in terms of fabrics, right? <laughs> and it was really marketed heavily as a feminist fabric as well because you didn't have to be slaving over a hot iron in order to have a, a beautiful um, silky outfit. The name Kiana was created by a computerized combination of random letters mm -hmm. and reached its height as a popular baby girl name in 1978. My mother named me Kiana after seeing an advertisement for the fabric while flipping through a magazine in her hospital room after she'd given birth. The name was unique, exotic, and rolled easily off the tongue. In 2012, I performed a Google image search for Kiana, curious to see what was on the internet about the synthetic fabric. That search led me to discover an online archive of other women named Kiana, predominantly black, African-American, and Latino. These women were my namesake. And these are just four of the images that I found. Um, I ended up finding over 50 of them. And even today, when I do a search for my name, there are some of these images still show up. Um, Google has since then, this was in 2013 that I did this original search, Google has since sort of changed their algorithm to suppress a lot of these what, what's called booking images or mugshots. But they still very much show up today. So performing that search multiple times, I collected over 50 mugshots, including booking information, which often contained personal details. There were other non-incriminating images in the search results, but the violence emanating from these mugshots overshadowed those vapid selfies. Reading over each woman's booking information, which was freely available online, I realized we were all close in age. We were all sort of born in the late 1970s. Um, and born during these years that marked the height of the marketing of the Kiana fabric as an affordable luxury, and yet clearly for most of these women, bearing this name offered no privilege. In his 1986 essay, I read a lot, I read a lot about photography specifically, um, the, titled The Body in the Archive, historian, critic, and photographer Alan Sekula. Anybody, any Alan Sekula fans in the, in the audience? Um, parallels the emergence of photography in the context of the development of police acts and technologies of surveillance. Sekula's text questions the instrumental use of the camera to identify and control what's, what he called the criminal body, with the mugshots being its most effective method. Styled to be an objective portrait of the subject under arrest, the photographer is not present in the mugshot. It aims for neutrality. It is a standardized, not individual, systematized portrait. It purports to be, quote unquote, natural, so that the criminal is exposed in all of his or her evil and malice. Although I didn't know them, I felt a kind of kinship with these women. In some alternate space, time, or social trajectory, my mugshot could very, very well be amongst them. As a <coughs> photographer, I felt responsible for their representation. 
So now I'm going to talk to you about this namesake series that sort of came out of this research that I did. The images in the namesake series were created by printing and then re-photographing those web resolution mugshots I sourced online. These, quote, photographs of photographs were shot at very close range. My camera lens within inches of the prints with the aperture wide open. The resulting images are abstracted and nebulous, the bruisey colors that metaphorically reference a violence, like the black and blue marks that appear and disappear after a body has experienced physical trauma. Others have told me that the images in the series also resemble fingerprints. The unique impressions are deliberately used in law enforcement as markers of human identity. So it's no coincidence that Francis Galton, who I believe was uh, a cousin of uh, uh, Darwin, sorry. Uh, he also used photography, Galton also used photography to regulate social de deviance and encourage the use of fingerprints in forensic science. The images in these series are shown in groups of five, as is typical in a police lineup. They are set in, against the backdrop of this sort of institutional gray and placed at varying heights to accommodate for the fact that these images represent real people. The namesake series calls attention to symbiotic acts of violence that shaped the identities of this peer group of black women, including racial profiling, violation of privacy, corporate influence, and consumerism, among others. Today, Google's image search index and its results, and it's an archive of repressive photography, a tool for social surveillance. With this work, I question exactly who is afforded privacy and agency in our digital age. The 12 images in the inherited series pattern, uh, inherited pattern series, sorry, this is the next series coming up, were created as a sort of a next iteration of what I call the Kiana project. So this, this sort of Kiana project is an ongoing project for me that I kind of pick up um, over time. Um, this was the next series that came, and it was really sort of a commission for um, the New York Public Library. I was invited to show work in the picture collection, which is now housed in the main um, Mid Manhattan branch, but it used to be across the street. Um, and I made these images um, for that specific uh, space. Um, these collages, these are so these are physical collages. These are prints, both um, black and white sort of Xerox prints, as well as color f photographs of the mugshots. Um, they layer fragments of these mugshots um, against black and white catalog fashion photography from the DuPont archive. DuPont has a huge um, sort of campus in Delaware. And so I visited the DuPont archives, went to their library, and asked them to give me everything they had on the Kiana fabric. And uh, these images were in that um, collection and in that archive. Inherent Patterns fuses two aesthetically opposing photographic genres. So you have one genre being the mugshot, and the second genre being the, the catalog fashion image. So through collage, I wanted to make the sort of formal introduction between the fantasy world of Kiana and this sort of real life um, Kianas. Because in other ways, they, I, I don't think these, these two worlds would ever collide. The black and white images sourced from the DuPont Company archives were created for use in public relations and marketing campaigns for the Kiana fabric. The color mugshots of the women named Kiana are cut up into swatches that reference fabric samples. These textile swatches are meant to represent a whole, a free resource for designers. Swatches are useless in the final design and ultimately discarded. Each image from the series is printed on Tyvek. Tyvek is a recyclable DuPont material, and it's actually mm -hmm. one of their most sort of popular products nowadays. Tyvek is used in anything from medical scrubs to um, insulation for housing to postal envelopes. Um, it's a really flexible fabric, and you can also get it printed with like inject coating, um, which is fascinating. So it's often used for outdoor signage, so it's very durable. Um, so I printed these at sort of like 40 by 60 for the New York Public Library. Um, and it, it, it's just, it worked really well in that specific space because, you know, the picture collection has houses these millions of images, right? These clippings that they have clipped over the years. Um, and so it, it almost felt like these images were sort of emanating from the picture collection. 
These collage images are a kind of portraiture, anti-portraiture, sorry, that comment on the social legacies of consumerism and consumption, specifically marketed towards American working class women. As the Jamaican critic and philosopher Sylvia Winter argued in her 1976 essay titled Ethno or Sociopoetics, she says, quote, Western man is the first human being in the history of the world to totally inhabit a commodity culture. Commodity culture, on the other hand, is the agent and product of the process by which objects invent man as another object label human. Man's power to name objects is turned against him. Objects name him. Freedom is a Cadillac, unquote. Or in this case, freedom is, quote, a polyamide fabric having improved resilience and silk-like hand combined with superior washware performance. And that's a specific quote from the patent that DuPont filed for Kiana. So I'm just going to show you the rest of the images in the series. Um, I typically, so for this series, I have sort of this flesh tone colored borders that you see around it. Um, I often use this sort of flesh tone color continuum in my work. I also covered the model's um, eyes. Um, one, I didn't want to implicate them in, in this work at all um, because they were simply doing their jobs. Um, but two, it also kind of references um, a form of privacy, a form of censorship that oftentimes we don't use in this country. Actually, outside of America, outside of the United States, criminals have, are afforded a lot more privacy than um, they are here. Um, you know, the, the, no such thing exists outside of America as the perp walk. It was kind of created here in America. This, um, and so, um, and oftentimes when a criminal's image is published in newspapers um, in, outside of the US, you will see their face sort of distorted, sorry, in some way, or perhaps this black bar is, is also present to protect their privacy. These images are also displayed with, their, with these titles, um, which describe the type of dress and the, um, the designer who made it. I really had fun making these too. It was, you know, it's a very sort of heavy subject, but I really enjoyed sort of figuring out the placement um, of these images as well, and I, I really like how this sort of references has a religious reference almost context to it. The black and white images are also really kind of degraded um, because I wasn't using high res images from the archive. I, did, I never asked for permission to use these, um, so I was just using sort of web resolution images, um, making these collages by hand, and then scanning them to then um, print them on the Tyvek at large size. So next I'll talk about uh, the Black Doll series, which began while I was developing these, the previous works in the Kiana project. Um, so it was also born out of the sort of crit critical thinking around racial and gender identities, and which is often linked to our role as consumers. The Black Doll series goes on to further explore these connections. American female slaves were the earliest makers of black dolls for their own children, as well as white children in their charge. The mass production of black dolls for more seemingly sinister purposes dates back to late 19th century toy production in Germany and France. By appropriating the listing photos of black vintage dolls for sale on e-commerce sites like Etsy and eBay, I created a collection of these new sort of non-gestural digital images that are rooted in this aesthetic tradition and style of geometric abstraction. One common use for dolls across cultures has been to represent the human figure and to instill a sense of care and maternity. Although for many children of colors, particularly dolls chosen for us are often our first introduction to the divisive concept of race, specifically if the doll's color doesn't match our own. As a mother, I question the roles doll play, dolls play 
in establishing conventional expressions of gender and racial identity. I'm further interested in how the mass production of these dolls have perpetuated or upheld stereotypical opinions about femininity, motherhood, and blackness. The Black Doll series pairs each new abstracted images with the seller's original item description. So it creates this sort of interplay between the sort of social representation and personal memory. What happens when these doll images are digitally broken down? The way that I make these images is simply by using one filter in Photoshop, and then I'm adding color on top of it and adjusting the, um, the settings on this filter. What happens when these images are sort of formally broken down into just color and shape? What meaning, if any, can we derive from their descriptions and their captions? And some of these captions are really interesting, like this one, which just puts a, a question mark right in the middle of the caption. And shabby but beautiful. Like, what does that really mean? <laughs> um, can abstraction be used to deconstruct and reveal the inherent prejudices of the doll form? After making this work, I realized that Sorry, I'm just going to cycle through a couple of these. But I realized that there are two, two visual artists that really kind of may have influenced me subconsciously um, that I had learned about in art history classes in high school. Um, one is Frank Stella, which I'll show you in a minute. I really like this title here, too, um, especially the I think she's vintage part. And most of the forms really don't reference any type of body or shape or doll shape. This is probably one of the few that do. This is an installation of the work uh, that was up last year in uh, London at the London Art Fair. There was a specific section of the London Art Fair called Photo 50, um, and this work was chosen to be exhibited there. So as you see, I sort of really sort of formally frame these images. They're eight and a half by 10 or eight and a half by 11 in size, which so I really wanted to kind of keep the intimacy of the sort of doll form and the size of that doll form. Um, and then I also pair them with the description underneath. It's always about sort of what's this interaction and this interplay between the image and the description for the viewer. So this is Frank Stella's Empress of India, um, which is massive in scale, as you can see. Um, but for me, you know, even though this is part of what, what he called the V series of paintings, I, as a, as a young person, as a young student, automatically interpreted um, Frank Stella, this being a, a painting of a person, of an Indian woman, um, especially because it was titled Empress of India, what apparently that title, Empress of India, is actually refers to um, Queen Victoria, which is a title that she assumed when India became part of the um, British Empire. Um, and so, uh, it, yeah, I, I just, I, I really feel like this image, along with, um, the work by Ansei Uchima, who's a Japanese um, woodcut artist, and he was kind of really major within the abstract expressionist movement. Um, but I really love the sort of idea of being able to interpret a scene or a person in an abstract way. Um, and so this one's titled A Clear Day. So onto my next series. As a woman of mixed heritage, my work contends with what it means to be black and white in America. Uh, in 2017, The Kitchen, in collaboration with the Racial Imaginary Institute, led by writer Claudia Rankine, presented a symposium on the phenomenology, distortions, and diagnosis, diagnostics of white dominated space. For me, this symposium centered the political position and privilege of whiteness amidst our country's changing racial dynamic under the current administration. I started this series by reading a botanical book on the history of weeds by Nina Edwards. Uh, it's a fascinating book that traces the changing role of weeds initially introduced as garden plants and then becoming more aggressively known as an invasive species. Edwards shows that the idea of the weed is a slippery one, constantly changing under different needs, fashion, and contexts. Reading this book, I became particularly interested in the popular and historical use of plants for ornamental purposes, the international introduction of plants for foreign lands, to foreign lands, and the use of the garden to delineate colonized spaces. So I kind of started this series by photographing um, botanicals and flowers, um, 
just ones that I happened to come across in my neighborhood. Um, and I was photographing them through this sheet of synthetic vellum that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I really kind of liked how the light was filtered through, and I liked a sort of surface um, that was between me and the subject. The images in this series go on to consider the extent to which whiteness is operationalized in more mundane and material ways. How have I, in my lived experience, felt whiteness operate? And so in each image functions as informal notes or visual records of these personal memories and thoughts. The images are imprinted on a synthetic vellum, which give them a translucent sort of ethereal feel. Uh, I chose vellum as a surface to print on because the images, um, sorry, because of its historical reference to skin. Um, I don't know if it, many of you guys know, but vellum is made from animal hides. So vellum in particular is made from calves, from sort of baby, baby calves, sometimes baby calf fetuses. Um, and parchment, which is sort of a cousin of vellum, is made from sheep, sheep skin, sheep hides. Um, both of these sort of surfaces have been used in religious texts um, to make books. I believe the Dead Sea Scrolls are partly, mostly made of parchment and vellum. Um, and uh, it's also used in uh, writing, the writing of laws. So the British um, government still writes its laws on parchment. One, because of um, just uh, it's, it's a habit for them, but also because of um, it's durable. It's a very durable um, surface, and it, it's highly archival. It lasts for centuries. Um, and particularly, they were arguing um, recently because they wanted to sort of get rid of this budget, because nobody really makes vellum or parchment anymore. There's very few farms that do it. Um, and they were trying to sort of save money by, you know, sort of digitally archiving their laws just, you know, on servers. And they really kind of voted against it because, they're, you know, they just really thought that there might be another sort of Y2K instance where computers will be wiped out and, and their laws would then no longer exist. So they still sort of write their laws on parchment and vellum and keep them in the Tower of London. Um, after printing the images on the vellum, I suspended them within the standard white frame. And this is for a recent showing that I did. I'll show you in a minute. I showed five images of this series. Um, and this on the right side is um, how you prepare vellum, um, how you sort of clean it and stretch it. So you take the animal hide and you stretch it on these stretchers. Um, and then there's this sort of sickle-like instrument that's used to clean it of the hair and of any other sort of impurities. Um, so I really liked this sort of form. It felt really visceral and raw. Um, and I kind of tried to mimic that a little bit in um, the presentation of this work, which you'll see in a minute, um, here at the Brick Biennial, which was shown earlier this year. Um, I just sort of suspended the images within this white frame um, by puncturing the, the images with um, a cord, with a hemp cord, and really tying these, tying them and stretching them within the white frame. Um, and that sort of also enabled light to kind of filter through the back of the images as well. And this is the, sort of the first time that I've really pushed presentation as well in photography and really kind of tried to bring um, a lot of the ideas to full fruition that I was thinking about when making the work. So now I just kind of wanted to show you, after showing you some of the sort of conceptual work that I've been making, um, as I was saying earlier, I do make, um, consistently make the sort of documentary style family work. Um, I have a family of two children and one husband, uh, so it's sort of very much a nuclear unit. Um, and uh, it's something that I'm always sort of drawn to. Uh, you know, I, I'm very much attracted to light and um, I don't, go for sort of high drama situations. They're often kind of really quiet pictures that I make. But I do feel like it's important for me to make this work. A lot of the photographers that I admired, um, like Eleanor Carucci, um, not so much Sally Mann, but um, I do admire her work in some sense. Um, I think most photographers actually make work about their family. I think for the most part, 
most of us don't actually share it um, or don't actually get or are afforded the opportunity to get a book published about it. Um, Elliot, um, sorry. I'm also sort of playing recently with this idea of the diptych, um, which is a form, again, kind of again going back to my art history <laughs> training and education, a form that was used in sort of early religious paintings and panels. Uh, but you can also kind of see the diptych in, you know, sort of the representative representation of family photographs in any anyone's home, really, sort of in the 80s and 90s and 70s. A lot of people would have these sort of like book-like frames that could close, um, and so I really love the sort of intimate intimacy of this kind of way of showing pictures, and also the associations that might pop up um, when pairing images together. This is an image that an image that juxtaposes a, a, a photo of my husband as a child, and then a photo of our son. This is also a father and son diptych. A lot of these images are within sort of a span of ten years, so even though I call it new family work. Um, a lot of them, I, I sort of have this editing process where I shoot, 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 and then maybe every two years or so I kind of take time to actually edit and sit down and look at images and, and pick out the ones that I like the most. My son is the most willing model. <laughs> of all the family members. And sometimes I catch them unaware. Sally Mann actually talks about the importance of sort of the, f the female photographer, the role of the female photographer shooting males because typically within photography history it's always been the opposite. It's always been sort of men shooting women and looking at women. Um, and so she has developed a whole body of work around her husband. Um, and I, I agree. I think it's important to buck that trend. Sometimes there are images that don't include a body or a person, but do reference some aspect of family or growth or exploration, curiosity. Quiet moments. And finally, it's time to talk about my other work because Jaime did introduce me as a writer. Um, but I do, I have been writing this blog since 2007, Dodge and Burn. It's not on a regular publishing schedule anymore because having a blog and sustaining a blog does take a lot of time. Um, but I started the blog back in 2007 when I was working a full-time job. Uh, and I was kind of bored and I was kind of just really wanting to get back in photography. I hadn't been shooting for years and I kind of was remembering a time I went to college for photography. I studied three years um, color photography there under a very well-known American landscape photographer. Um, and I remembered a time when I had a meeting with him and I'd asked him, you know, are we going to look at photographers from other countries? Um, are we going to look at black photographers, Latino photographers? And, you know, he gave me two names. He gave me Lauren Simpson and he gave me Carrie Mae Weems, which I was grateful for because I hadn't actually heard of those women before, um, and sent me off to the library. And luckily they did have books of both of those um, women's works. Um, but, you know, I was really sort of, I started this blog sort of feeling like the history of photography is very um, homogenous, very whitewashed, very, um, not very inclusive. And um, clearly there are other histories of photography, and clearly photography did travel to many other countries outside of Europe very early on. And so I started the blog sort of as a way to educate myself, as a way to understand who these people were, who were the peers of 
you know, um, the early photographers and the early sort of inventors of photography. And also, who were some of the more contemporary folks? Who, were, who was shooting in the 1970s besides Gordon Parks? You know, who was sort of um, shooting in the 80s and the 60s and the 40s? Um, and so eventually through this blog, um, I started doing, making this really for informational posts, but then I really came across this format of interviews um, that I started doing of photographers of color. Um, and it was a great way to for network internationally, uh, but also to educate myself. And it then also became, the blog also became sort of an educational tool. I would get emails from uh, photo educators across the, the country saying, you know, I use your blog as part of my curriculum. Um, and it also afforded these photographers that I was interviewing, it afforded them a, a visibility that they hadn't had before. For some reason, my blog was sort of being picked up by photo editors and, and critics and people, uh, be, I guess because it was sort of so, so niche. Um, and people were able to get, people that I would interview would be, be able to get exhibitions uh, and, and other sort of types of attention that they hadn't had before. Now the blog sort of functions more as a critique group. Um, and this group I formed um, sort of the year after I graduated from the MFA program at ICP Bard. Um, I really felt like uh, not being in an institutional or educational setting, I needed a place where I could regularly meet with people and talk about my own work, talk about their work. Um, I also wanted to create a safe space for photographers of color where we could talk about social issues that maybe no one else wanted to talk about or maybe no one else could uh, relate to. Um, you know, as photographers, sometimes it's a very lonely practice. You, you know, you, you could show your work to your family and they'll, they'll, maybe they'll be like, yeah, it's great, but you won't get sort of really critical feedback. Um, and so I wanted to create that space. And this Dodge and Bird has become this sort of peer, peer led group. I'm, I'm just the host. I don't really lead it in any way. I sort of, if I, if I feel like conversations are slowing down, I kind of poke people with questions, but um, I really just have been an administrative role and I've literally hosted um, the space. This Most of these pictures um, are taken in my studio space that I've had from time to time when I don't have studio space. Um, other members then host it at their studios um, or their spaces. So it's really a collective effort. It's really a group effort. Um, we're organized both on social media, so we have a private Facebook group that we organize through. Um, I also send out monthly email uh, emails in terms of getting people to sign up for the critiques, um, and it's it's been really it's been a really generative space, a really generative process for people, um, both people who are formally trained in in photography as well as people who are self taught. Um, so it's something I really enjoy, and 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 am now getting sort of opportunities as well to create and host this critique spaces in other institutions. As a writer. Um, which really started with the blog, uh, I've really been interested in writing about works that I felt have, haven't had the attention, the press um, that they deserve. And uh, so I've written for, these are just three of the publications that I've written for, typically art and photography journals. Um, and they're very much critical writings, they're very much essays. Um, my last piece was for a exhibition catalog for a show in Brazil titled Mai Preta, which means Black Mother in Portuguese. Uh, and I wrote about two photographers in particular, Nona Faustine and Marcia Michael, uh, and wrote about sort of the role of black motherhood in photography uh, and for that exhibition catalog. So I, every, every year I probably have at least one or two uh, writing assignments. And for me, I find writing to be very much a creative outlet. Um, there are often times where I can't pick up the camera for any reason, uh, or I just I'm not inspired to. Um, and at least I can stay engaged with the photography by writing about other people's work. And that is the end of my presentation. Not sure if we're early or on time, but thank you so much. Uh, I welcome any questions from you guys. Uh, here are some links to social spaces and websites. Um, where you can follow me if you're interested in learning more. Right, thank yeah. you. Um, maybe I'll start things off. I'm sure. curious about your other other work, which is motherhood. Yes. And that book that you published, How We Do Both. Yes. Um, can you talk about the book? Yes. 
So it's called uh, How We Do Both, Art and Motherhood. And I, I'm the co-editor of the book along with Michi Jagardian, who is, uh, she actually is the president of the Camera Club of New York, or also known as Baxter Street. She's also an artist in her own right uh, and, a, and an independent publisher. Um, but we started the book, uh, we went to the MFA program together, and we started the book because we had submitted to a call for papers for a motherhood conference that was held in Toronto. And uh, we were sort of always kind of talking throughout the program, even though we only had a year together, she was a year older than me, we were always sort of talking because we were the mothers of the program. We had children, we couldn't stay around after class and go out for drinks and socialize the way that other students could. Um, and we just, we just had unique concerns. Um, and uh, we were also looking, we were looking for mentors, we were looking for people who had done this before. We were, you know, we said to ourselves, there, it, it couldn't be possible that we were the first mothers to attend graduate school, you know, like, especially for photography. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were looking for um, role models and people to kind of look to. Um, and we found a few in, in you know, women like Mary Kelly and sort of um, other women like that. But we also found that there were a lot of people who were parents in general that just were closeted about it. And it was so bizarre. It was just so weird. And we literally had someone who we interviewed for in the book who said that she created work under a male pen name because she was advised that not to use her name since she was a, she was a mother and that she basically her career had to be over once she became a mother. And so we decided to do this book, which is a collection of essays and responses from people who basically said, fuck it, I'm gonna, you know, I, yes, I'm a mother, yes, I have children, I have to tend to these people <laughs> and grow them, but I also have to grow my own self. I also have to, I owe it to myself to be creative and to stay creative um, and, and to really de develop the sense of self. Um, and so the, the book is a collection of honest responses. Some artists took the liberty of just kind of writing free form. Um, one of the artists that wrote Freeform, this really beautiful response is Justine Curlin, who is a photographer, and she really wrote this really honest um, response about how for the first five years of her son's life, she would just take him on the road with her to shoot. And, you know, it would be her, Casper, her son, and her large format camera in this one van that she would pack up for five months, and it would just be the two of them. And, you know, somehow they were safe, nothing happened to them. But you know, we have pictures of her in the book, um, and we have you see her son Casper sort of playing in this vast expanse that is you know Middle America. He's playing on the side with trucks, and you know, and here she is setting up her large format camera, and it and she made it work somehow. Um, and that is probably the, one of the most controversial responses because so many people are judgmental and they say, well, how could you do that? You know, that's so dangerous. <laughs> like, you know, you didn't even have a man with you. You know, people kind of respond in that way. But um, we really, we've really gotten a, a hugely positive response um, from this book. Um, it's now sold out after two editions um, and is selling for a ridiculous amount on the aftermarket. It's clearly something that people want to hear about. Uh, we just haven't, you know, both Meech and I are super busy, um, and we just haven't gotten the time to kind of get it together. We, we've talked about it several times, and we'd like to. The first, um, the first iteration was sort of hand printed, and we were like kind of like printing and stapling these these booklets together before the conference in Toronto. The the the, the actual first edition. Um, was printed through Secretary Press, which is her imprint, and as well as the second edition. Um, and now the third edition we'd love to sort of do with an actual sort of uh, more established book publisher, but we just kind of need to get it together. Um, and yeah, there, there's so many more voices that I would love to, to um, document. And I would love to do a father edition as well because <laughs> I feel like there are fathers out there who are also raising children and making, making work. It was really beautiful to get to see the different types of work that you're making. Um, you. And the one series that struck me specifically was the um, Black, Black Doll. The Black Doll series. Yeah. Um, and the thing that I think about first is um, uh. you said that you always keep the description kind of close to the image and and for me it's this interesting kind of what uh, there's the the abstraction that 
um, is next to it or above it. Um, but then what is this image that we get created that based on what we see and what we're reading, how do we then kind of recreate that? So I think that's a fascinating component. Um, and you. then I have yeah. to imagine that you are, have heard of this, but just have, are you familiar with the, it was a psychological st uh, a study that they did, the research study with the good doll and the, are you familiar with, do you know what I'm talking about? There's, yes, I think Gordon, there's a like famous Gordon Parks picture um, oh. where it's, it's there, it, as part of that study, and there's like a young black boy and they've, there's a, an adult sort of holding up a black doll and a white doll in front of him. Um, but yeah, I am very familiar with that city. Yeah, and then they redid it, I guess, like 40 years later, and, this, mm. and it still is the same. So it's like this kind of interesting. It is really interesting, yeah. especially in children. Um, How will it, you learn these messages so early on, even from like a preverbal? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just recently kind of questioning, like, what, what is the need of dolls, really? Like, wh why do we need to recreate a human form for children to play with? It's kind of a really strange thing. Um, but dolls have played a really interesting role throughout history as well. Like, I was reading about how during the Civil War, dolls were used to s sort of send messages between enemy lines as well. So, um, you know, th they've sort of had this role as mules as well. Um, and I'm sure, you know, in, within the drug trade as well, there, we, you know, dolls have been used um, so yeah, they're they're really kind of interesting things that kind of fly under the radar, but I feel like their presence does shape um, young minds in, in interesting ways. When you were talking about motherhood and how it sets up um, kind of stigma for women artists, where if you're a mother you can't be an artist, mm -hmm. do you experience any tension between being a critic and being an artist? A similar divide where people say, "Well, if you're a critic, then be a critic. If uh, you're an artist, be an artist." No, I mean, I feel like artists now are um, very much uh, multi-hyphenate in a way, right? Like, because there is, I feel like that sort of stellar art career is so unattainable for most of us, um, and so the, in the ways that we exist as artists now are. We, we, don't, we make our own work, but we also curate shows and we also write about other people's work. I, I really feel like that is a very common role for artists nowadays. So I don't, I don't really feel any tension between, and I don't really criticize work um, either. Um, because I, the writing that I do do, that I do, the commissions that I do take, uh, like I said, are really meant to um, give visibility to artists that I feel like have been ignored and are, are typically ignored um, because they're talking, perhaps their work talks about topics that are uncomfortable that people don't want to talk about. Besides Dodge and Burn, what are some other places where people can see really good work by artists of color? Uh, um, social media. I feel like Instagram has really I have a lot of conflicting thoughts about Instagram. I teach social media to photographers at FIT. Um, and so a lot of what I teach is actually about sort of the psychology of social media and social media and mental health. But I do feel like Instagram has become this sort of very democratic platform where photographers can share their work. Uh, on the flip side of it, there has been this sort of Instagram effect <laughs> that photographers had sort of been very concerned with making sure that their feed looks a particular way and has a particular color tone. So that I'm not too keen on, but I do feel like, especially for international photographers, um, it has been a platform to give them, like I said, a visibility that they may not have before. To you know, and and I do know for a fact that Instagram is a platform where art collectors look for new work. Uh, editors and sort of the gatekeepers of the art world do look to Instagram as well for to find fresh talent. Um, but yeah, a lot of the other blogs, um, I, d I think Lens Culture does a pretty good job. I, th I thought the New York Times Lens blog, when it was operating, um, was at least in the last couple of years was feeling feel, was doing a very good job of of uh, representing photographers of color and really sort of putting out work of diverse voices. Uh, thank you so much, Kiana. Thank you for having me, guys. <laughs>